We're good. All right, let's bring it back in. Hopefully you guys had some good conversations, whether you're watching online. You can always text us while you're watching this, either it's live or later. Um, that'll go straight to my phone. Let me know what you thought. Um, helpful, helpful for me to get into your brain a little bit and kind of see where you guys are at, because I know where I'm at, and I can preach to myself all day long, but that's not the call of a shepherd. Um, so <laughs> with that, the title of today's sermon is The Disneyland Effect. The Disneyland Effect. So our tendency, as you guys well know, is to be really excited about stuff at the beginning, but eventually there's kind of this cliff where the excitement just kind of goes and then eventually just drops off. There's actually a, a medical condition known as anhedonia, which is the inability to experience pleasure. And they actually say that it, that it comes as a result of building up these walls where you have to have more and more and more and more and more, and eventually just nothing will satisfy that emptiness. And you kind of go into this depression. And not all of us might be experiencing it quite to that level, but we all have these different areas. If you guys were here in Southern California, most of you guys have probably been to Disneyland. Maybe not all of you guys, that's okay. Or some exciting place, whether it's a pumpkin patch or Universal Studios or, or just somewhere that has that excitement, that, that fresh, that first time of, wow, this is so amazing. And the first time you go, it's awesome. And then you go back and you're like, wow, this is great. But if you keep going over and over again, eventually it just kind of falls out. It might still be somewhat great, but it's just not what it was at the beginning. We lose that passion. We, we lose that, that excitement that we had. We lose our first love for these things. So for today's purposes, we'll call it the Disneyland effect. Because what Jesus is going to do is in the letter that we're going to be focusing on today, he's going to be writing to the church in Ephesus. And he's basically going to be telling them, you've got the symptoms of the Disneyland effect. You started great. Everything at the beginning. Go back to what you were doing at the beginning. That's not where you are anymore. You're doing some great things. You might still be excited. You might still be having fun, but, but you're just not where you were at first. And he invites them to go back to their first love. And the, what I want you to walk away from, and this is what we're going to build on the entire time, is that a church without the love of Christ is a dying church that will not be around long. A church without the love of Christ is a dying church that will not be around long. It'll free up a building for another church to come in and buy them out. But it's not going to be around long. Because at the core of the church is God. God is love. At the core of the church is the love of Christ. And that's what he's going to be writing to this church in Ephesus. So we're going to be unpacking that a little bit today in Revelation verse, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Not revelations. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ through John to his churches. So as I mentioned, we're switching from Jesus's to him who has ears, let him hear statement in the Gospels, now moving to Revelation through John. Before we get into specifics, though, I want to set up the next seven or eight weeks that we're going to be dealing with Revelation. So we need to know the context. How, who's writing this? How are they writing this? Kind of what's going on? What's the purpose of these letters? So before we get into Revelation 2, go ahead and open your Bibles up to Revelation 1. We're just going to read the first three verses and talk about it a little bit. So Revelation 3, or Re Revelation 1 starting in verse 1. We're starting right at the beginning, you guys. Very first verse in Revelation. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Now listen to this part. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written, for the time is near. So these words were written to a specific audience. But just so you know, that audience extends to you and I here today. So what I need you guys to hear before we read one word in Revelation is blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written, for the time is near. This whole series, to him who has ears, let him hear. That's what we're going to be going into. Jesus is saying, listen, there's a reason I'm writing this. I'm not just writing this for a great story to, to put you to sleep at night. There's a reason that I'm writing this. And if you just hear these words and actually understand them and apply them to your life, man, it's going to be powerful. In the next seven weeks, we're going to be looking at these letters that are written to specific churches, specifically the seven churches in Asia. And seven in the Bible is this number of completion. So really, by extension, he is kind of writing to all the churches, but through the context of these specific churches. These aren't just generic things. These are real issues that are taking place in these churches that he's writing to. And before you say, well, well, how does that have anything to do with us? Well, the truth is, you don't need to go very far to realize that 
some of the issues the early church was dealing with are the same issues we're dealing with today. It's the same things we're struggling with today. So these seven churches represent these, uh, the churches all around. It's written to specific, but it's written to all of us. And what we're going to see is that Jesus is writing to these churches, and to each church, he's going to describe himself in a unique way. He's going to commend what is good, except for two churches where there actually isn't anything good to commend. He's going to rebuke what is bad, except for some exceptions where, where there's not really anything to rebuke badness at the time. And he's going to give them solutions because he is gracious. And then he's going to tell them what is on the line if they don't listen and what is at stake when they do listen. So he's writing to these specific churches, but man, there's nothing new under the sun. You really do not have to go far. We like to think that we're unique as a church, that, that no church has ever dealt with the same struggles that we have to deal with. Well, yeah, the church has existed since Jesus, but, but man, they didn't have the same sexual revolution to deal with. They didn't have the same struggles of pornography and all these different things going on. We just have a unique struggle. Jesus wouldn't necessarily understand what's going on. It's just a different culture of the time. Yeah, it's a different culture. You want to know the culture of the church that we're right, talking about today in Ephesus? You see, there was a goddess named Artemis. And the way that you would worship Artemis is that around the temple of Artemis, there was prostitutes, both male and female, and by sleeping with them, you are worshiping this god. So before you say God doesn't understand the sexual revolution and the temptations of our time, he absolutely does. And he's actually writing specifically a letter to churches who are dealing with even worse perversion than we've ever imagined here. There's nothing new under the sun. Well, yeah, I mean, the early church didn't have the same political turmoil. Do you know who, who we've elected? Do you know what our system looks like? Yeah, you're right. It was much, much worse. You see, oftentimes they didn't have elections. The church has survived the rise and fall of so many different nations. See, we're worried about what might happen. Imagine actually living through the fall of a nation, being conquered by other nations, being forced into slavery, all these different things that the people of God have had to endure. God understands political turmoil. And God steps into that chaos. And he actually has instruction for us. So there is no God you don't understand. Well, yeah, they didn't really have racial inequality. Yeah, right. It is filled, the church was filled with these struggles and these things they had to overcome. One of the very earliest issues in the church was this issue of racial inequality between the Jews and the Gentiles. This division. Paul even has to call out Peter for basically being a racist and not including the Gentiles and wanting to sit over here and eat only with the Jews. So God doesn't understand our racial inequality. He absolutely does. And his answer that he gives to us through his word is the same cure for us today, that we would surrender more to him, that we would lean into him, that we would not try and fix things on our own, but just obey the word of God. You see, it's just not true. There is nothing new under the sun. That is why the Bible is so important. And that's why it's important that we read these words out loud and actually hear them and heed the warnings and respond in obedience. So with that, our introduction to Revelation, as he's writing to these churches, let's read the letter to the church in Ephesus, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Jesus says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So right there, remember I told you he was going to specifically identify himself to these churches. So to, to Ephesus, Jesus is identifying himself as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So Jesus is here. He is present. He is all-powerful, and he is present in this church around the lampstands because the lampstands represent the churches. He says, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake and that you have not grown weary. Now, I wish we could just put the Bible away because that sounds like an awesome letter to get from Jesus, doesn't it? Man, that would be the best letter you could ever get. It sounds like a great church. Man, I, I, I see that church. I look online. I see what they're all about. If they said, hey, we have a letter from Jesus comment, commending us for all these things that are doing great. I'm like, dude, how do I join? How do I sign up? Let's be a part of this church. But he doesn't stop there. He says, he does, he does the typical compliment sandwich, right? He starts off saying, listen, man, you're great at these things. You're awesome at this. You're terrible at these things. That's what's coming, right? But he's so loving. He's so kind. He, he, he tells them what's going on. He tells them, listen, these things are great, but he's not, he, he's so loving that he's not going to let them off the hook. Man, we, we think it's loving just to not tell anybody their faults, but sometimes that's not the most loving thing we can do. Sometimes the most loving things we can do is to be honest with someone to walk with them in growth. And that's what Jesus does with this church. 
He says, listen, these things are great. But if I let you walk away right now with just, yeah, we're great, keep doing what you're doing, you will lead to death and I will not be present among you for much longer. You see, a church without love is doomed. It is a dying church that eventually will be an empty building. So let's continue on. In verse 4, the rebuke. But this I have against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Remember, Jesus is present around the lampstand. So he's saying, listen, there's a way through this. You can turn away. Remember what you did at first. Do the things you did at first, and I will continue to be present with you. But, but if not, it's okay. I'll just take my lampstand. I will continue to be around the lampstand. It just won't be with you for much longer if you don't have this first love you had at the beginning. He says, yet this you have. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Yeah, this is, this is going to be a convicting series. There's a reason pastors usually avoid revelation. Sometimes it causes us to actually have to deal with some of our stuff, right? So I want you guys to think about this idea of, of the Disneyland effect. If you can remember for a second that passion that you had when God first got a hold of your heart, and, and if you don't remember that passion, I, I would I really have you ask the question, did God really get a hold of my heart? Because, man, an encounter with Jesus is kind of like an encounter with electricity. You get hit with a lightning bolt, you're going to be changed. You're going to talk a little different. You're going to walk a little different, smell a little different. You're going to be different. And a true encounter with Jesus Christ is going to leave us different. But if we don't continue to go back to our first love, to remember all these things, to do what we did at first, we can start fading away. And what used to be a passionate response, an overflow of loving God, which led us to love others, and we just wanted to make disciples, we wanted to share the good news to the world, what used to be all those things, they've just kind of taken a back seat. Or maybe we're going through the motions, but, but it really doesn't mean anything. So I want us to remember, so what does he mean by they lost their first love? Because this can kind of be vague language, which sometimes isn't super helpful for us. So you have to remember that the, these people, the, the Ephesians knew who they were. They knew what happened when they first received the gospel. They knew what their first love was. And the good thing is we can too. Because in Acts 19, we actually see what happens when Paul came to the church in Ephesus. See, Paul finds people who were baptized into John's repentance, but they weren't necessarily baptized in the name of Jesus. So what that means, it's not just some semantic thing. It means that John came baptizing repentance to turn away from your sin and just walk in a new way. But Jesus came and baptized with fire and with the Holy Spirit. You see, the baptism of Jesus is different. So he came and, and he said, listen, have you received the Holy Spirit like the what? So they have been trying to walk faithfully and obediently. They, they turned away from their wicked ways, but, but they weren't walking in the power of the Holy Spirit the way that God had given the gift and the helper. So Paul gives them the Holy Spirit, and he stays teaching daily in the synagogue and reasoned every single day for two years. I can never complain again about having to prepare one sermon every week. Every single day he was reasoning and preaching in the synagogue for two years. Let's just highlight some of the stories of what happened in this revival when the Holy Spirit fell on Ephesus and people were just in love with Jesus and, and people were turning left and right and being baptized and receiving the Holy Spirit and walking in obedience. So much so in that area. that There was this, the, these sons, the seven sons of Siva is what they're called. And, and they saw that people were casting out demons and, in Jesus' name. They saw all these powerful things and they wanted to get in on the action, not really surrender to Jesus. They just wanted to have those superpowers, right? They wanted to chase the supernatural. They wanted to chase these things. So they actually go up to a demon-possessed man, and, and they say, in the name of Paul's God, we cast out this demon. And the demon's response is awesome. Because he says, Jesus, we know. Paul, we've heard of, which, by the way, can't that be what we aspire to? Like, don't you want in the spiritual warfare of the kingdom someone to say, in the name of Daniel, like, okay, Jesus, we know. Daniel, we've heard of. How awesome would that be? Like, this is just Paul humble bragging, right? Paul, we've heard of, but who are you? And it says they attacked them, so much so that they lost the pants that they were wearing and ran off bloody and naked. So I don't know if you've ever been in a fight. Sometimes it's hard to tell who won. Both are kind of beat up a little bit. If you come into the fight with pants and you leave without pants, you lost that fight. Without question, you lost. 
You're running off bloody naked. There is no, well, I got a good right hook in there. I don't, it doesn't matter. You walked away bloody and naked because you lost your pants from the fight. And from this, there was this, this great revival. They were praising God, confessing sins, which confessing sins, that's kind of like, man, I'm, I'm really struggling. I didn't need you to know. Can you pray for me? Kind of these basic things. But it goes in and says they were actually divulging their practices, which means they were actually walking in deeper relationship with one another. Now, I'm not saying you go divulge your practices to everybody you meet, but I'm saying there's a way that the church walks in a unity and at a depth where they are fully known by one another, continuing those, those things that are deep inside you that you're like, man, I, I, can, I can just let people know I'm struggling, but I could never let anybody know what I'm actually struggling with in detail. But this is what the Spirit of God did. That these people were saying, listen, my relationship with this, this brother or sister in Christ is way more important than my pride. It, it, it's worth giving up my image that I might be fully known and grow up in Christ. I, I want to read specifically Acts 19, verses 17 through 20. It kind of gets into to, to this revival that we see. So Acts 19, verses 17 through 20 says, And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, talking about the sons of Siva, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them, and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver, which is about $6 million in today's money. So the word of the Lord continued to prevail mightily. They were gladly willing to burn $6 million worth of these things that used to profit them to make sure that they would not go back to what would destroy them. Man, my question for you guys, are we doing this today? When God calls you out of sin, when he calls you to put sin to death, are you really putting it to death? You're like, okay, I'll stop doing that for a while, but I'll keep it a pet. I don't want to die from it, so I, I, I won't go full in, but I'll, but I'll keep it right here. I heard an illustration. We try and treat sin like a bull. You ever see those rodeo riders? They have this giant 2,000 pound animal. They get on, they, they tie themselves up as tight as they can, and then they, they actually shock this bull in one of the most sensitive parts of the body to get it to rage, and they just try and hold on for dear life. And for them, a victory is eight seconds. That's how we treat sin. We're proud of ourselves because we got on this, this thing and we, we kept it as a pet. Look, I, I held tight for eight seconds with this in my life. It's like, why are you even getting on the bull in the first place? We can't make a sin, we can't make our sin a pet without that pet eventually turning and destroying us. So the question is, are, are we actually getting rid of these things that will lead us back into these patterns of death? These things that will continue to cause us to sin time and time again. Or are we so serious? Are we so passionate that we do not want to go back to those things? We just cast them out. Okay, I'm not in the world anymore, but can I just keep this world over here? No. You got to get rid of it. Because what's on the line is so important. It says the whole economics of Ephesus actually changed. Because th there was no money to be made off of these seedy, shady things that they could make money off of before. These people who would make these silver statues of Artemis in the temple to go and worship, they actually weren't selling anymore because there was no desire for it. And there was a riot, and that's eventually why Paul had to leave. Can you imagine if that's the kind of revival we saw in West Los Angeles? Can you imagine, just for a moment with me, that the awe of God fell on this city so much so that every strip club had to shut down because there was no business to be had in West L.A.? Can you imagine if drugs and human trafficking and, and all of these things that are going on around us, if they just had to leave because there was nothing to be made because God had moved so mightily in and through the church in this city that there was no profit for them anymore? Hard as they might try. Can you imagine if that's West LA? That's the first love Jesus is talking about. And he's saying, listen, you've fallen victim to the Disney effect. It was good at first, but now it's just another place where you go wait in lines and spend way too much money and eat 17 times a day. If you guys have been to Disneyland, you know it's all about the food. <laughs> Ephesus had become a great church by worldly definition. Hey, they knew their Bibles. They called out false prophets. That's way more than a lot of our churches do today. They even didn't tolerate evil in the camp. They would put it out from among them. They worked hard. They served the house of God. But they didn't know the God of the house. I stole that from Mike Burnett. I just want you guys to know that. 
it is possible to serve the God of the, the house of God without knowing or serving the God of the house. Point number one. It is possible to serve the house of God without serving or knowing the God of the house. Churches are great at getting people plugged in. Put you in the parking lot, serve on the greeting team. All these things that we want to do, come do these things. But ultimately, if you're serving the house of God, but you don't even know the God of the house, if you don't actually serve the God of the house, it doesn't mean anything. Our default tendency as Christians is to settle into the work of God without pursuing a relationship with the God of our word. It is our natural bend to continue increasing in knowledge of God, but never being captivated by the beauty of God. So that's the invitation. Not to leave here with your head hung low, feeling like, oh, I just need to try harder. No, 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 you're missing the whole point. You need to know God more, and the natural outpouring of that will be a changed life. Man, I quote this often because I think it is something we do not, we, we cannot afford to forget. But in Matthew 7, it says, there will be many who come to Jesus at the end and say, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. And he says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. We need to realize that it's possible to serve the house of God without serving or knowing the God of the house. Don't be so quick to get plugged in to try and fill a need that you haven't actually stopped to pray and say, God, what would you have me do? Where would you have me go? God, how would you have me live my life and use everything that you've given me? Don't just copy and paste what another church is doing. Don't just copy and paste what the itinerary is. Listen, God has called a church to be a certain thing, and he will provide for that church to walk in that thing. It's a very unspecific thing. But God has designed churches to operate in a certain way, and he will gift you. So the question is, if you feel like you can't fill these needs, are you really called to have that ministry? Man, we really want to have a strong hospitality ministry where we're just, we're just putting out these amazing donuts every single week. We just can't seem to find someone to put them out there. We can't seem to find, okay, are you really called to that ministry? If that's someone's heart, if that's someone walking in obedience to what God's called them to do, there's nothing wrong with that. Stephen was in charge of the hospitality ministry in the early church. But we don't just copy and paste because what they did, now we want to do. We need to serve God, not just play church, not just play religion. And that's point number two. God will not be tricked by the right motions without the right heart. God will not be tricked by the right motions without the right heart. In Galatians 6, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from his own flesh corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap from the Spirit eternal life. Man, we see this everywhere in our lives. You don't get credit for being a good timeshare salesman because you're treating someone nice. You want something from them. And the second you realize you can't get that from them, it's adios. Go to a restaurant, servers are very, very nice to you. Unless it becomes clear they're not getting a tip. And then it'll flip. I worked in a restaurant. I know exactly what it is. These nice people, the second they walked out the door and it was less than 18%, profanity. Oh, hey, what happened to that nice persona? I thought you loved these people. Yeah, but they didn't tip me. Okay, so now we know the heart. Now we know what the point was. Husbands and wives, does it do you any good just to try and appease your wife so she doesn't yell at you? Is that actually building loving relationship and growth? Or are you just trying to stave off suffering for yourself? What's, what's your heart in doing these things? You might be going through the right motions. I'll wash the dishes because I, I just don't want to get in a fight again, right? <laughs> Sitting close to home, you guys. But no, the desire is not that you just do these things out of obligation. The desire is that you have this heart that says, listen, I know you've had a hard day. I just want to serve you. Can I, just, can I just cook for you and clean for you tonight? Because you do so much for this house. Can I just help serve you the way that God has served me and, and the way that God serves the church? Can I just help serve and love you? Man, that outpouring, even if it's a small action, the heart behind it is so much more. Our politicians. Do you believe there's anything sincere about what a politician says? No, it's something we all know. It's to get a vote. It's to manipulate. It's to get what they want. The heart behind it is not sincere at all. It's virtue signaling all the time. We might get tricked by it, but God doesn't. You need to know that the right motions are not as important as the right heart behind them. That's why he's writing to this church in Ephesus saying, listen, you're doing these great things, but you've lost the love of Jesus at the heart of it. You've lost the core. And you're in danger of the presence of Christ 
being removed from your midst. That's point number three. When we forget our beginnings, we forget our purpose. When we forget our beginnings, we forget our purpose. You see, the foundation of the gospel in your life is that while you were a sinner, Christ came and died, and you are saved by faith alone, through grace alone, and the finished work of Christ alone, and that is the foundation. But what happens is we forget that, and we try and build a new foundation. We saw this in the early church between Jews and Gentiles saying, okay, we're saved by this, but now let's pretend we're saved by circumcision. So let's add circumcision into the foundation, and they just keep building off of this faulty foundation. And they're building something. Man, it it starts off with a foundation. It's just not the right foundation. It's not a solid foundation. You might be building on the foundation of calling out false teachers, endurance, serving. But when you lose your purpose, when you lose that beginning, when Christ came and got you, you lose the gospel. You're just building your own building. God's saying, that's fine. You are welcome to build your own building. People all over this planet are building their own buildings, whether it's political, whether it's socioeconomic, whether it's racial. People build their buildings all the time. They have their own little clubs. That's fine. You are more than welcome to do that. I wish you wouldn't. But if you want to have church without me at the center of it, that's fine. I'm just going to take my lampstand and I'm going to walk away. Because if you don't want it centered around me, you don't want me there. Because I'm going to be around my lampstand. And if you want me to be the heart and the foundation, if you want the gospel to be the true foundation, then that's great. But if you want your own Christianity without the love of Christ, I just won't be there. I would rather be there, but if that's what you want, I would just get in the way. Because there's going to come a point where it's going to be annoying that the church you want to build doesn't look like the church that I'm calling you to build. So I'm not going to stick around. I'm not going to keep trying to encourage you to to, to build this church. I've done that, but listen, eventually I'm going to walk away. He takes his lampstand and he goes. And that's what's at stake. What's at stake is the presence and the power of God in our churches. And he is writing to this church in Ephesus, not because he wants to take his lampstand away. You need to recognize this. That's not the discipline. A parent doesn't discipline their child, hoping they do it again so they can come back and discipline them again. That's not what happens, at least in healthy, good relationships. Jesus is disciplined. His words here are to say, listen, look at what's at stake. You are not too far gone. Get back to your first love. And that brings us back to our first question. When you lose that passion and that love for something, how do you get it back? How do you get the magic of Disneyland back? You have to remember. And as I was thinking about it, there's, there's two different ways we can remember. The first way is just to actually sit and remember, right? You remember your own story. You remember your testimony. You remember what God did in your life, or you remember the first time you went to Disneyland. And it does do something. That's why we play off of nostalgia. They bring back what Disneyland looked like when you were a kid, and you, you remember all these things, and all of a sudden you feel it again. But there's this second way that we remember. Our kids. Or seeing through someone else's eyes. You see, you remember your beginnings by sharing your story with other people. I go to Disneyland with my six-year-old niece, and I am ecstatic because I get to see it through her eyes for the first time. And man, I remember how excited I was, and it, and it brings more joy. I get, I get that first love back because I remember what it was like to be there because it just reminds me of that spark in my own heart. And if that happens with something as silly as Disneyland, how much more will that happen in the church? Listen, when you share your faith, I guarantee you your own spark will be reignited. You go share the gospel with someone, first of all, you remember that you forgot a lot more about the gospel than you should have. I did all the time. I went to Bible college. Someone asked who was Jesus, and I started talking about inaugurated eschatology and dispensationalism and predestination. Like, I I got so far out, I just forgot the basics. He's like, dude, he asked you 101. Like, why are you getting into 701? (laughs) But you remember the foundation. You remember the story. You remember you share the gospel. And it reminds you of your own story when God came and found you. And that's the invitation, to remember the foundation and to continue to build on that foundation. Many of us are here and we're frustrated with the state of the church. Jesus knows. This is one of seven rebukes. 
If you're here and you're frustrated at, at, at what you see in, in the church around you, you need to realize that if you're frustrated, Jesus sees through the facades that you can't even see through. For every pastor that falls and we hear about it and we just get our stomach turns at the sin that's in the church, God knows way before us. Every second that God was using broken people to come seek and save the lost, God knew all the wickedness and he was trying to call people out of darkness and into light. He knew all the things that are going on. And he knows the ones that haven't come out yet. All the scandals that haven't broken. All the behind the scenes. He doesn't just know the actions of churches. He knows the heart behind them. These organizations, these, these churches that we have all around, if we get sickened at some of these things, imagine how much more God sees and knows. But you also need to realize that he knows you and your heart and your struggle. And he doesn't just see the bad, he also sees the good. He sees the good worth saving. He sees the good worth redeeming. And he actually sees the direction to point you in. And that's why he's given us his word. Because he doesn't leave us hopeless. So as we read through these seven things, these seven letters to the seven churches, would you just pay attention? Because, man, I, I am betting that there's something in here that God wants to get a hold of your heart and change, if not all of them, to redirect you on the path that we would be gathered around the lampstand of Jesus, that we would be with him, present among us, serving God, not just serving the church. He knows our struggles. He knows the struggles behind the struggles that we don't even know about. Talk about this all the time. God is so patient. For that sin that you're really struggling with and you're trying to battle, and if I can just conquer that, man, I think I'll be good. God's like, you have no idea. Once that's done, we got to deal with your pride. Once that pride's done, we're going to have to deal with what's behind that. And it's so patient because our bent is to lean away from God, to listen to the world. And we will struggle with sin until glory. And we will walk in faithful obedience, day by day, picking up our crosses and following Jesus. In the richness of his love and mercy, he has stepped in to our mess. And he has offered us a way out. Surrender. Remember what God has done for you. It's going to change the way you live. Go back to your first love. Remember and do the things that you did at first. That's where revival breaks out. The way is not to just try harder. This is not some formulaic thing. This is the presence of God. The reason that those things happened at first is because of the presence and power of God among them, with them, moving through them. And that's what he's inviting them back into. They would be foolish to miss the entire point and say, okay, so let's gather up $6 million worth of books and burn them. Does it matter what they are? I don't know. That's what we did at first. So maybe just $6 million. Yeah, just throw them on the pile. That's not what he's talking about here. He's saying, do you remember when I changed your heart so radically and drastically that your entire city was transformed? It was contagious, more contagious than COVID. And it spread. And the word of God was proclaimed. The way out is not to try harder, it's to surrender more. Not to look to yourself, but to look to Jesus and remember what he has already son said and what he has already done through Jesus Christ. Do not believe the lies of the enemy, but remember the promises of God. Rest faithfully in his word. Get back to your first love. Go home and think about that moment when God came and found you. Man, if, if, if you've never made that decision to follow Christ, if you feel like you've never really encountered God, you've never really wanted to surrender to him, you, you've been one foot in, one foot out, you're just kind of trying to toe the line, trying to stay in the world, and, and really you're like, maybe I can make it to heaven. It's just not how it works. There is no toe the line. You're in or you're out. And that invitation, that, that, that what you have in your heart right now that you feel like God is calling you to, that's the invitation of the gospel. To surrender. To admit that you are a sinner in need of saving. Not trying to pretty up your past to say, I think I'd probably make it into my own merit, but just in case, God, would you forgive me? No. Admit that you're a sinner and there is no way to heaven without believing in Jesus and putting your faith, hope, and trust in him. Confess him as Lord which means to serve him, to surrender him, to say, God, where you go, where you lead, I will go. Not my will, but thy will be done. And to live it out. That is how we see our church flourish and grow. That is how we see our city transformed. That is the life-changing power of Jesus Christ, and that is what we need. Before we leave, I'm going to invite Damien back up. And we're going to sing one more song together. 
because I felt like it would be a travesty to actually go through this passage and not sing our favorite song, Spirit and Truth. As we pray that God would take us back to our first love as a church, as believers, as human beings, and that we would fall more madly in love with Jesus. So we're going to sing this song, and then I'm going to come back up and pray us out. guys would. Sorry about that. Would you stand with me as we sing? Take us back to our first love, Lord. Oh, we want is to see you and all we long. Yes, we know you are hearts undone. You are hunger again. You're reaching past our agendas. You're piercing through the familiar. You bring us back into wonder again. In spirit and truth, we're running back to you. Oh, my soul is worship you with our arms held tight this love of ours will rise oh my soul we worship you sing that again all we want all we want is to see you in all we to know you are hearts undone and you are hunger again you're reaching past our agendas you're piercing through the familiar you bring us back into wonder again in spirit and truth we So we worship you with our arms held high. This love of ours will rise. Oh, my soul, we worship you. We worship you, Lord. Won't you take us back? Drawing us closer than we've ever been, ever been. You're taking us deeper than we've ever known, oh, ever known. And you'll see you deeper than we've ever seen, oh, ever seen. We're giving you all we are, our everything, our everything. You're drawing. Closer than we've ever been, who oh, ever been, and you're taking us deeper than we've ever known, we've ever known, and you were seeing you clearer than we've ever seen, who oh, ever seen, and we're giving you all we are, our everything. Spirit and truth, we're running back to you. Oh, my soul, we worship you. Yes, we go. With our arms held tight, this love of ours will rise. Oh, my soul, we worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, oh, won't you take me back to my first love? Take me back to my first love. Take me back to my first love. Just remember your story.
Take me back to my first love. Take me back to my first love. Take me back to my first love. Remember what the Lord has brought you out of. Take me back to my first love. Take me back to my first love. Take me back. To my first love, when I met late. you that day, Never Lord, oh, won't you take me back to my first love? Take me back to my first love. Take me back to my first love. In spirit and truth, do we sing? In spirit and truth, we're running back to you. Oh, my soul will worship you with our hearts held tight. This love of ours will rise. Oh, my soul will worship you. We're here with this Lord to remind us of where we were. Remind us of where we were and how we loved you, Lord. When it was just you and me, me and you, going through life, spending time together, Lord. Let's just throw this up again, Lord. Wouldn't we be reminded? of our Savior, of our friend, of our Lord. Lord, you gave us everything. We didn't even know who you were, Lord. But you came and you showed us who you were. We were doing our own thing, Lord. We didn't have hope. We didn't have a future. We were blinded by the world. And you came and showed us. We're forever grateful to you. We're sorry for where we've gone, Lord. We're sorry if we're not as close as we used to be. But you're there and you've always been there. In spirit, we're running back to you. Oh, my soul will worship you, yes, Jesus. With our arms held tight, this love of ours will rise. Oh, my soul will Let's close in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for today. God, I pray that you would use this message, that you would use your word mightily among your people, Lord. God, that those who are far from you would come to know you. And that story, that foundation would just continue to build and, and remind us of our first love, Lord. God, may we not be caught playing church. May we not be caught going through all the motions without the love of Jesus at the core of every single thing we do, Lord. God, would you just remind us, not that we stop doing good things, but that we remember the foundation of why we do them in the first place. God, every time we are serious about righteousness, God, every time we care for the sick and needy, God, every time we, we call out bad theology and false teachers and, and we walk in truth and spirit, Lord, would we do it all because of the love of Jesus that lives in us? Would it be centered around your love? Let it be a response to what you've done in our lives. Not just because we've memorized the pattern of how to look like a good, healthy church. God, would you continue to do what only you can do? God, in this endeavor, Lord, we want to be made more and more like the image of, the, of Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to be more and more like you. You know all the pitfalls along the way, and we turn to you. God, you see all of it. 
you see through all the manipulations, all the selfish desires, all the trying to make ourselves look better than we are, or trying to convince ourselves we can make sin a pet, Lord, all of it, you see through all of it. So we just come humbly at the foot of the cross and lay it all down and surrender. Say, Lord, here I am, send me. God, use me because you are everything. Every breath, every minute, every second, every dime, may it all be used for your kingdom, for your glory. God, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys, love you all so much. Be blessed and be a blessing. Um, I do want to let you know, so yesterday we actually went out and started up um, a little bit of a ministry. Uh, we ended up making some sandwiches and taking them out to some of the homeless people in our community, prayed for them, got to talk to some people, had some great encounters. God was present doing awesome things. If you would like to be a part of that, we don't know exactly what it's going to be. It's not mine, so don't give me any credit. It's all my wife. She's awesome. Um, well, God gets all the credit, but God's working through her. I'm allowed to brag on her. She's just not allowed to brag on herself. Um, same way about myself. Um, but yeah, so if you want to get involved in that, let us know. Um, just give us your name and number. We'll put you on the list. That way, when we go out and do something, we can invite you guys to join us. Uh, it was really, really awesome just having these conversations, really healing, really helpful, and just a way to practice what God's given us. But once again, we don't do it as an empty word. We do it because of what Jesus has done in us. So we do it together. With that, love you all. Be blessed and be a blessing.